Number five in this list is the pit. So this one is less scary and more just gross if I'm being honest with you. Frivolous on Reddit says, When I was in the scouts, or rather the local equivalent, legally adult scouts had to do the three feather challenge. One day without food, one day without speaking, and one day and night alone in the woods with only a knife and a tarp unseen by any human, after which one has to sneak back to the scout camp unnoticed by the sentries and report to the camp master. It was my third day, so I took off, walked for miles through the woods, and found the most remote spot in the wildest, most overgrown part of the woods. Spent a spooky but uneventful night until almost before dawn when I decided to go for a morning swim in the lake right before taking off to go back. I stripped nude and went towards the lake, but noticed a group of guys fishing, so decided to go back. Suddenly, the ground underneath my feet caved in and I found myself submerged up to my armpits in the absolute vilest mass I have ever smelled. It was a pit where poachers dumped the guts and leftovers of illegally hunted deer and it fermented for weeks. Imagine the scene. A group of anglers hear some ungodly screaming from the direction of the woods and run there to see if someone needs help. What they see is a teenager shaped ghoul covered completely in blood and rotten over who's crawling out of a bloody hole in the ground while shrieking and weeping, then runs at them. I can't imagine how gross it would have been to fall into a pit of dead, rotting animal guts as you're completely naked. Like that alone would have scarred me for life. And then on the other side of things, to be the anglers and see this golem-like creature covered in guts running at you. I would have thought that whatever this thing is just took down a massive animal or something and that I'm about to be next on the menu. One would also think that if you're about to do some illegal poaching, that maybe hiding it in a spot where people don't walk would be a good idea. Like, I obviously don't know anything about that world of things at all, but this whole scenario just seems pretty dumb to me, guys. Either way, at least my dude made it out okay, although he had to be covered in guts first. Number four on this list is the swinging bag. This story is one that defies all of our understanding of physics. Ranker writes, My scout troop was on a 10-day backpacking trek at Philmont Scout Ranch in New Mexico. We were hiking in the southern region and must have been on night 4 or 5. We got to the campsite after a surprise thunderstorm that dumped some hail on us. We set up camp and built a fire to dry out our clothes. While sitting around the campfire, someone noticed that a 10 stake bag was hanging on a nearby branch of a tree about 5 feet off the ground. It was swinging back and forth, hard enough that the branch was moving, though no wind was blowing. We stopped it from swinging and watched to see if it would start up again, and it did. It took a few minutes to get going again, but it was swinging on its own in the same direction. We all went to sleep for the night, only to find it in the morning still swinging. We have no idea what would have caused this. Yeah, and what would have caused that. I think our guys would have noticed if the wind was really acting up or if it had anything to do with that. This sounds like something paranormal for sure. I'm honestly pretty surprised that these guys were left alone that night. Something like this is a telltale warning sign. A ghost or a demon basically telling you to get the hell out of there. The fact that they managed to live through that night and just had the bag sway was really weird. Either way, still a pretty chilling tale. In third place, we have a scream knockoff. While Taylor was in her last year of university, she was determined to make extra money and decided to post ads online for babysitting and dog walking services, adding photos of herself and her phone number in an attempt to appear as legitimate as possible. Roughly an hour after finalizing her posting, Taylor was cooking herself dinner and heard her cell phone ringing from where she left it in her upstairs bedroom. Sadly, she couldn't retrieve it immediately since, you know, she was handling a lot of hot pans, so she let it ring out. A few minutes later, it began to ring again, and when she didn't retrieve that call either, whoever it was called back and repeatedly until she was finally able to leave her pans and bolt upstairs to answer it. When she picked up, all that she could hear was heavy breathing. So after she didn't get a reply, she hung up, but the phone rang again the moment she put it down. Annoyed by this point, and I would be too, Taylor picked up once again, this time finally encountering a male voice. The conversation began normally, so Taylor assumed that the call before was just a bad connection. He explained that he had a duo of very young offspring and wanted to know if she thought she could handle that responsibility. Taylor informed him that she had experienced dealing with poorly behaved clientele before and assured the man that she could handle what he was describing. The man followed up by asking if she could do any overnights, and this is where the uh, red flag started to kick in for Taylor. Dang, I should have brought one today with me to uh, count them off. Oh well, just imagine it, right here. Whee! Thanks to common sense kicking in, she firmly said that she would not babysit overnight and was met with only heavy breathing in response. 
She asked if he was still there, and after a period of silence, the voice asked, Are you a virgin? Taylor, completely stunned, hung up the phone immediately. The phone kept ringing nonstop for the next hour. The alpha man had withheld his number, so she couldn't specifically block that number at first, but then eventually found the function to block withheld numbers on her phone, did it, deleted her number from the ad site, and went on to message every other person on there in her local area with a babysitting ad to warn them, finding out that this caller was a common annoyance or rite of passage to those who had listed their numbers. Poor Taylor was so scared that she was jumping at every shadow for the rest of the evening. In second place, we have the end of a life. Sheila Schrock was a teenage orphan who lived with her older brother in Birmingham, Michigan, an attractive and affluent community. Sheila was babysitting in an upstairs room of a house at 1772 Villa Street early in the evening of January 19th of 1976 when she was surprised by a man who had just come from breaking into three other houses in the neighborhood, holding a pry bar and a screwdriver. Her assailant, described by a witness as a thin young white male, somewhere between the ages of 18 to 25, around 5 foot 10 or 6 feet, with a sparse beard, prominent nose, pointed chin, uh, removed her clothing, forcibly fornicated with her, and as this horrified neighbor witness watched from a nearby roof from which he was shoveling snow, ended her with a series of shots from a semi-automatic. Hmm, that's specific. Allegedly, the attacker looted the home, making off with a firearm, jewelry, and blended in with the crowd on the street to escape. The eyewitness described the vehicle as a 1967 Cadillac, and even with all this detailing, he has never been apprehended. Poor Sheila. Like, that is such a specific remembrance of somebody's face, and even with all that, you can't apprehend him? Dang. In first place, we have a complete kidnapping. On October 24th of 1953, Viggo Rasmussen, a professor at La Crosse State College in Wisconsin, hired Evelyn Hartley, the daughter of a fellow professor, to take care of his own very young daughter. That evening, Evelyn's father Richard called the Rasmussen house several times after she failed to check in as planned around 8.30 p.m. and was met with no answer each time. Concerned, he drove to the house, and when he arrived, the doors were locked, the lights and radio were on, and items were scattered all over the house. The living room furniture had been moved around to different places, ditto for Evelyn's school books. Richard found her shoes in different rooms, with one shoe upstairs and another downstairs. He also found his daughter's broken glasses upstairs, but no sign of his actual daughter anywhere in the home. During the search of the house, Richard observed that every room that could be locked was in fact locked, minus a basement room at the back of the house that had an opened window that was missing a screen. The missing screen was located outside of the room in the backyard, leaning against a short step ladder. Pry marks were found on some of the windows, and footprints had been found in areas of the house, along with traces of um, red fluid, leading to red handprints, on the garage that was over 100 feet away. Oddly enough, the charge Evelyn was watching was still fast asleep and unharmed. Police believe someone took Evelyn through the yard, but dropped her on the ground before carrying her further, and this was supported by the police dogs who tracked her scent trail that ended two blocks away, where it's assumed that she was tossed into a vehicle, just like a sack of potatoes. They were told by one neighbor that they had seen a car repeatedly driving around the neighborhood, and another person who lived nearby claimed they had heard screams an hour earlier, assuming it was just from local kids playing. Now before anyone calls out nonsense on that, have you heard kids playing in the neighborhood? That gets loud. Two days after the incident, local resident Ed Hoffer told police that while driving his vehicle, he was almost hit by a dark green, two-tone 1942 Buick as it was speeding in a westerly direction. So for me, I'm like, okay, green car? Inside the Buick, Ed reported seeing one man was driving the vehicle, while a second man was in the back seat with a girl. Ed also reported that a few minutes before the incident, he had seen the same two men with the young girl as he was pulling outside his brother-in-law's house, located conveniently around the corner from the Rasmussen house. Ed stated that the girl was wedged between the two men, and he had thought that she was, you know, intoxicated, as the two men were holding her by the arms as they were walking down the street. Now, if you think this all sounds a little too suspicious and made up, you're not alone. The police did bring in Ed as a suspect, but sadly, he passed two lie detector tests, and no remains or DNA were found on his property. Some folks, such as um, myself, are pretty sure he had something to do with all of this. Several days after that fateful night, various items of clothing, many of which were stained with red, were found at different locations, and tests proved that the red stains matched Evelyn's DNA. Over a thousand members of the local community, including law enforcement officers, the National Guard, Boy Scouts, and lacrosse state college students and faculty participated in a search. A vehicle inspection program was also undertaken with the intent of searching every vehicle in La Crosse County. Gas station attendants were asked to check cars for red stains, and recent graves were reopened to determine if Evelyn's remains were placed with a recent burial. In May of 1954, mass lie detector tests were conducted on La Crosse area high school boys in an attempt to find out more information about Evelyn's disappearance. Though local authorities had planned to test, you know, 1,750 students and faculty, the testing was controversial and was halted after around 300 were tested. And to this 
this day, no clue what happened to Evelyn. Coming in number five, bug eyed. We love a good pun from time to time, but this one might just stick with me for the rest of my life. As a person who's worked at swimming pools and summer camps, I've seen all sorts of different stuff get into people's eyes from sticks, rocks, chlorinated water, bird droppings, and of course, bugs. Hell, I had a gnat fly into my eye while I was biking just last week. But these are all things that can be removed relatively easily if you're careful. They're not trying to make a home in your ocular orb. This story from Reddit user Oscar Devine makes me want to scream and you're about to find out why. It goes like this. I've told this story before. I'm an eye doctor and I had a patient come to me with an infected eyelid two other eye doctors tried to treat and failed. They were dumping all sorts of medicine into it and it wasn't getting any better. At this point it was swollen and painful for weeks with no improvement despite being on tons of meds. Apparently neither of them thought to flip the lid upside down, you know the gross trick that some kids do with her upper eyelids. It was a painful maneuver for her very swollen eyelid which might explain it. Anyhow, there appeared to be what looked like a visible abscess inside the tissue with thick gooey material. I thought I'd give it a nudge and I saw it move. This wasn't an abscess, it was something else. I managed to remove it quite easily in one whole piece. It was a fly larva. The patient told me that she had a bug hit her in the eye a few days before she got this infection. I removed the larva and within two days the wound closed and she was 100% recovered on basic antibiotic eye drops. Yes, I do have the photos for this case for those interested. I mean, I for one. I'm not interested. Walking around with a larva in your eyelid for weeks and not bothering to figure out what it actually was? What if it was like wriggling around in there? What if it decided to start crawling around and looking for food? This is the kind of body horror I would expect in a movie, not real life. Although what is real life if not horror? Let's keep moving. Coming in at number four, we've got some unwelcome tenants. This is a personal fear of mine played out right before someone's very eyes. The idea of a silent, sneaky, and altogether uninvited individual deciding that the nooks and crannies of my home are free real estate just drives me nuts. And the worst bit is you're living in blissful ignorance of this until something finally sticks out and other patterns reveal themselves. Those bumps in the night? That wasn't the house settling or whatever other explanation your grandmother might have given you. That was a squatter moving around in the dark. All that food seemingly going missing. It sure wasn't partially forgotten midnight snacks or your friends being greedy if you know what I'm saying. Those times the motion sensing lights went off in the middle of the night. Mm -mm. Not mice, raccoons, or squirrels. Boy oh boy. User iems85 told their tale in a thread about this particular occurrence. For about a year I lived in a house with four housemates. We had a pretty big backyard with a garage and a tool shed that we never used, ever. We also had motion detector lights. Two of my housemates were very superstitious and believed in ghosts and spirits and such. They also liked to get high on different substances. The lights in our backyard would go off randomly. I assumed it was animals, my housemates were sure it was a ghost. One of them told us she'd seen a man ghost looking through our window when she was high on shrooms. They thought it was scary, I thought nothing of it because, well, yeah. A few nights later, drunk me thought I saw a man through the mesh door to the backyard. I just thought my mind was playing tricks on me because my housemates kept talking about the ghost. Eventually I moved out to go back to my home country and about six months after that I facetimed with one of the housemates. Turns out we hadn't seen a ghost. A homeless man had been living in our tool shed for god knows how long. Gave me the creeps for sure. All this happening pre-pandemic is horrific, right? But imagine it happening now. You're always home and they have smaller windows to get out of their hiding spot. What if somebody died while in your home because they couldn't get enough food or couldn't get outside and you didn't even know until you smelled something funny? That's not an experience I ever want to have. Number three, the stalker. Michael Melanson is a former Marine and foster parent living in a small community in California called Kings Canyon. While checking his Snapchat messages, Melanson noticed something unsettling. Among these usual snaps was one that stood out from an unrecognized username. Intrigued, Melanson opened the snaps unsure what to expect. What he saw made this fully trained marine chill. The message was a picture of Melanson with an unnerving caption saying, see you soon. More pictures would get sent showing places on Melanson's daily routine. His gym, his favorite coffee shop, a close up picture of the street sign where he lived. I would probably block that guy and actually chuck my phone into the river. I think that guy from two points ago had the right idea. But Melanson reached out to the authorities. It seemed like the Marine had a stalker. The police had advised him to save and document all of the messages as evidence and they launched an investigation, although little came of it. Surprise, surprise. 
The snaps continued and grew more invasive. More photos of the neighborhood and frequent hotspots. It reached its peak when one of the photos was that of Michael inside his own home. Michael then fitted his house with security cameras and confided with friends about what was happening. He became hyper aware of his surroundings, constantly pinging and scanning for any threats. The stalker seemed to have calmed down and the messages were dwindling out. Was it over? Mm, if only. Eventually, the police were able to track the IP to a location nearby. The subject was a disturbed individual with a fascination with Melanson, a young man by the name of Riley Poeta, who worked at the bowling alley Melanson lived below and frequented and did most of his business in. He was taken in. The story is a modern day horror movie plot, a reminder that not everyone in your neighborhood is as friendly as you might want them to be, and with the right information, anyone can get a hold of you. Truly spine chilling stuff. Number two, Thomas Sparks. Thomas Sparks was an amateur athlete who used his Snapchat mostly to highlight his athletics and daily vlogs about his life. A gymnast trying to attain as many world records as he could. And he might have broken the record for most haunted Snapchat story out there. Dubious one. Listen to the story he posted to Reddit. One day while browsing the app, Sparks uncovered a filter he hadn't seen advertised anywhere, which allegedly would show supernatural entities on camera. A joke, obviously, just meant for fun, sounds fun. Sparks uploaded a few videos showing off the filter, thinking it nothing more than a game. But as the days went on, Sparks noticed that even when he wasn't using his phone at all, he would occasionally catch glimpses of ghostly figures in his vision, vanishing when he tried to meet them head on. Sparks attributed it to working out maybe a little bit too hard and not getting enough rest and not drinking enough water. Stay hydrated. If you learn anything from Top 5 Scary, stay hydrated. Sparks said that after about a week after installing the filter, he began hearing faint whispers when he was alone in his bedroom and even reported that some objects seemingly were moving on their own. A lamp moved across his bedroom, things not being where he'd left it. Sparks was growing incredibly paranoid, I think as most of us would be if we invited a ghost into our home. Thomas contacted Snapchat support, but unsurprisingly, he, they didn't have much to offer for him, instead only giving a generic message stating that the filter is just a playful feature and the company doesn't take any responsibility for any paranormal hauntings that could occur as a side effect. Well, they probably didn't say that, but hey, have you ever read all of Snapchat's terms and conditions? That might be in there. Nobody's gonna sit down and read all that. They might have something about ghosts. Out of ideas, Sparks deleted the app from his phone and claimed that he'd stopped experiencing any of the paranormal activity that was bugging him before and has since not used the app whatsoever. What do you think gang? Was Sparks telling the truth? Did he unintentionally become a conduit for spiritual activity? Or is he taking home a gold medal for creative storytelling? You tell us. Also shout out to this guy just deleting the app. Everybody else went through all this like hullabaloo but he was the only guy who just figured out like oh yeah I'll just get rid of this. <laughs> seems way easier than anything else. And finally, number one. Snapchat stories can be a very mixed bag. There's good odds most of what you'll see is just sponsored junk, ads for IGN, models doing their thing, you know. But every now and then you come across something that catches your eye and hooks you in. Maybe too far. That's what happened to James Brett Varney, an educator from Moncton, New Brunswick. Varney reportedly, while scrolling through stories, clicked on one from a profile he hadn't heard of called Unknown Realms. The story in question was a series of random, quickly edited, unsettling videos. Cryptic symbols, unintelligible writing and sounds, and quick flashes of people in dark robes surrounded by candles and ominous objects looking like a deleted scene at a eyes wide shut. Varney was naturally unnerved by what he had seen, but brushed it off assuming it was probably just, you know, promo for some sleeper indie horror A24 hit that your friends are all gonna say is really good but you're never actually gonna watch. As time went on though, Varney found himself thinking more and more about the flashing images, saying that it felt like it was a dream replaying in his head over and over and it was bothering him infinitely more than some stupid little Snapchat story should. He kept coming back to it to watch it over and over again to see if there was anything he missed. He said he felt like it was an invitation to some call. He researched Unknown Realms for a bit but wasn't finding anything to attach it. No project, no movie, no video game. James went to report the story to the authorities to see if they'd help him but found that when he did, the video had been scrubbed from the app. Confused, James went on to research more into the phenomena and found others online who claimed to have all seen the same mysterious story. No one was able to get to the bottom of it. Recruitment tool for a clandestine organization? Art project by some bored art majors? We might never know. 
A reminder that there is so much hiding on the boundless wild west of cyberspace we may never get the answers to. And you know what? That's not such a bad thing. Sometimes some stories are better left untold, some snaps better left unopened. Number 5. Our first story, and not to give away too much of the plot here, but a lot of the other stories, came from a reddit thread positing the question, what's your scariest home alone story? There were many good ones, but the literal top comment was this by Killer or Angel. It was an average night around 9pm. Me and my cousin are at his house and I'm sitting for the night while my mom and aunt are shopping and my dad and uncle are at the movies. We're just sitting there feeling strange. Something was wrong but I couldn't really put my finger on it. I got up and walked to the back door to lock it. When I came back, I saw what was causing that weird feeling. In the window there was a decrepit and homeless looking man just staring into the window looking at us. My protector instincts turned on. I pretended I didn't see the guy and I told my cousin it was time to go to bed because it was too late. I took him upstairs knowing damn well there was a man outside that wanted in. Now at the time I was 5 foot 8 and only about 125 pounds. I did play football at school though. If I remember correctly I went downstairs to grab a meat tenderizer and I turned back to the window. He wasn't there. I ran to the front door and made sure it was locked and then I ran back upstairs and went to my cousin and sat down in front of the door. He asked me what was happening and I told him it was nothing to worry about, that he should just get some sleep. I called the cops and then my dad. The cops said they were half an hour away and my dad was 45 minutes away. I heard a window shatter and the sound of boots. I told my cousin to stay completely silent and hide under the blankets. It was horrifying. I grabbed the tenderizer and waited. About 5 minutes passed and I hear the boots walk upstairs. I heard him opening the doors to my aunt and uncle's bedroom, then the bathroom. I heard him make his way to the basement. After what felt like forever, the cops burst in, kicking the door in, and got the guy. Turned out, he was an escapee from a mental hospital a full province away. That's literally like the plotline to a horror movie. Absolutely terrifying, but good on him for having that big cousin instinct and making sure that the cousin was safe. And if you're looking for more freaky stories in this sort of vein, Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. If you want something else a little spicy than scary stories. We got aliens, cryptids, conspiracies, true crime, anything freaky. We've done a video or two on. So hit subscribe. Please hit that little bell so you don't miss a scream. But would you kindly do that at the end of this video? Because I got four more scary Home Alone stories coming up for you right now. Number four. It's another post from this same thread asking about people's scary Home Alone stories. This one very likely is going to have you locking the door tight and probably spending the night with the blankets pulled all the way up to your eyes. I had just moved into my first apartment. It was around 8.30 p.m. and I heard the doorknob moving like somebody was putting a key in it and turning and knocking. At first, I got pretty excited that my at the time boyfriend was home, but then I realized that it was too early in the day. He usually came home nearer to 11 and it was only 8.30 still. So I looked outside at the kitchen window and I didn't see his car or anyone's car that I recognized parked outside and that's when I started to panic. The doorknob kept moving for a few more seconds and then stopped. A few minutes later they had some piece of metal that they were sticking between the door to try and open the door. I freaked out and I locked myself in the bathroom. I grabbed a blade from the kitchen to try and protect myself. I called the cops. Whatever was on the other end was trying to pry the bathroom door open for about 3 full minutes before they stopped. Interrupting the story a bit, can you even imagine how horrifying that would be? Three minutes locked in your bathroom waiting for the boys in blue to arrive while someone's clawing at your door? This person is braver than I. For context, this video has been about four minutes up to this point. Imagine the entire video you just watched but you're petrified and shaking in a bathroom. Anyway, back to the story. Eventually the cops came in and they found an elderly man roaming my apartment with a crowbar. He used to live in my apartment and he wanted a bunch of stuff back that we took when we moved in. Police told me he was delusional. I'm so thankful and glad I didn't answer to the door. To this day, my heart still skips a beat when someone knocks on my door. And mine too. I don't think I'm opening my door for strangers anytime soon. Number 3. Swatting. Now for those of us who aren't on the internet as much, maybe you aren't super familiar with this term swatting. It has nothing to do with flies, but instead refers to the practice of obtaining a victim's IP address and then anonymously or falsely reporting serious criminal activity at the location, such as a bomb threat, 
hostage situation, or any other number of things that would necessitate the boys in blue packing up, getting in the van, and kicking down your door. The SWAT team shows up, kicks the front door down, ready to go, and tragically, more often than not, it ends poorly. And it happens to be a huge trend. It's even happened to celebrities like Justin Bieber and Rihanna. One of the biggest targets is gamers and streamers getting locked in vicious rivalries. Well, like many other illegal services, swatting is allegedly something you can buy through the dark web. Worried about the consequences? Don't want to spend money on an expensive trial for going to jail? Well, apparently you can hire someone to SWAT for you. One alleged website offers tiers of service, ranging from mild situations to a little worse. They'll bring many people and raid them, all the way to the lofty, the SWAT team comes and from there they'll do anything. Now despite huge sentences for SWATting, we up to 25 years to life by the way, in case you're wondering, it's still a fairly common occurrence. Disposable phones, encrypted phone numbers, and even Skype have all been tools for the would-be swatter. As such, various law enforcement agencies across the United States have been trying to crack down on the practice as much as they can in order to dispel any would-be swatters from getting any bright ideas and to dispel any more tragedies from occurring. Number two, bed bugs. This one is really out there. But I'm gonna be honest, it's the ones that are really out there that are the ones I'm most interested in, of course. I wanna bring you the stuff you probably haven't seen in any other top five videos, and this was too good to pass up. On a Reddit thread asking, Plainly, what's your dark web story? We had this from user UrbanHawk1, who said that in his time on the dark web, he saw all manner of nefarious business, but none that truly stuck out to him more, none that was stranger than one man who was trying to acquire a massive amount of bed bugs shipped to his home. Naturally, people on the Marketplace website were a bit Curious. Other users on the unknown website wanted to know why exactly you'd invite that sort of thing into your home. Most of us want that out. Well, the bug collector was looking to and paraphrasing the original Redditor's words. He wanted to try to breed bed bugs to be resistant to all the usual manner of extermination, while simultaneously breeding in a weakness that would remain secret to only him. From here, he would then unleash his genetically superior bed bugs onto the unsuspecting population, who would then have to pay him to have it dealt with since he was the only one who knew their weakness. Now if this one is sounding just a tiny bit comic booky to you, that's because similar schemes were also the plot of the villains of the Amazing Spider-Man movie and the Michael Bay Ninja Turtles. Now unfortunately there's, there's no follow up to this, I couldn't really find a second source on this anywhere and Urban Hawk's story is the only time I ever saw this particular anecdote mentioned, but it was too interesting to pass up. You have to wonder, maybe Urban Hawk? The guy who posted about it. Maybe he was the bed bug mastermind looking to see if there was any interest in the business. We may never know, but I'm definitely feeling itchy just talking about it. And number one, we see you. Our next story comes to us from a Reddit user going by the handle Fake Fakington. So, all that being said, maybe just take whatever he says with a grain of salt if that's how he chooses to advertise. Making matters more confusing, he does list his real name on his Reddit account as Truth Real Time. So who's to say? Now Truth Fakington, Fake Truth, he recounts the story of the early days of the dark web when everything was still very deep and dark. Back in the day, Fakey Truthy was browsing random links, just like us kids today still do. He describes a lot of it as not particularly interesting until he found sort of an early blog describing random thoughts, musings, and so on. But he said they felt a bit like someone was trying to pass secret notes to each other. So, curious, he wanted to know more about what he was reading and he compiled the IPs from the various messages and writings to try and get a better understanding about what he had found. Now he said he made his way through a digital rabbit hole to find himself in a collection of medical records, uh, the sort of thing that a psychologist or a therapist might keep perhaps. The images were mostly of faxes and predominantly medical but also military in nature too. As he was browsing through all of the files he had just uncovered, he noticed a new one had uploaded as he was browsing through them, the timestamp on the upload listing the exact minute he was browsing. The message was named, spine chillingly, hello there, infinitely braver than I would be, Mr. Fake Truthington opened up the file and saw that it was nothing but plain text that read out, we see you. And about 15 seconds later, the server dropped all together. Now, Fake Fakington is still around today. He's still an avid Redditor and tech ed and was able to bring us this story, but no doubt that one little incident probably kept him awake for a few nights and probably kept him away from the dark web for a bit. I know I would. In fifth place, time to visit a haunted house. Our lovely narrator Claire was familiar with the family, with her mom having taught the would-be clients in preschool, and was asked to cover a shift whenever the regular sitter was 
unavailable. Over the course of one evening in particular, four odd things happened. Let's count them down, shall we? First, the boys were pulling out food for dinner, and they set a container of salsa on the counter. Minutes later, while prepping food, the container burst and sent salsa flying all across the room, all over the walls, the cabinets, and the fridge. Odd, but Claire assumed it was just kind of old and some gas had built up in the container. I can't imagine that was fun to clean. Well, while she was cleaning it and the boys were in the kitchen helping her, they all heard a loud thud in the living room. Rushing as a group into the other room, they saw that two framed photos on opposite walls had fallen to the floor at the same time. Neither of them appeared damaged, but they both landed right on the floor. Claire propped them up against the walls, but left them alone. Weird. Later, when the entire posse was upstairs, Claire was waiting in the hallway while the boys took turns in the bathroom taking their evening showers, and suddenly she heard a weird dinging sound. She walked down the hallway and noticed that the computer in the study was turning on and off and making all sorts of weird noises. Sure, there are explanations for that, but after all the other events, Claire was very much on edge, and rightfully so. She finally got the boys to bed and went downstairs to watch TV for the rest of the time until the parents got home. As she was sitting in the living room, trying to relax her racing brain, she heard footsteps upstairs. And that's number four. Assuming the boys had gotten up, she tiptoed upstairs to check. Their bedroom door was closed, and when she peeked inside, both boys were fast asleep in their beds. Claire went back downstairs, and within minutes, she heard the creaking yet again. The boys never called out to her, and there wasn't any noise besides that. She didn't report anything else weird happening, but I would recommend a deep spiritual cleanse of the house if I were that family. Just my two cents. In fourth place, we have a case of moving dolls. As someone who collects creepy dolls, this story definitely intrigued me from the get-go. Here's the thing with dolls with a personality, okay? They have to be treated with respect, carefully preserved, and be in a quasi-emotionally stable environment, or else weird things are, um, they're gonna happen. Don't worry, I promise a video on my personal creepy doll collection is coming soon. I'm just waiting on one of them to be ready to take a day trip to be on camera. It's a whole thing, but... We respect boundaries. Oh, uh, where was I again? Oh, right. Poor Ashley. She arrived at the Lanford house one night, ready for what she thought was a typical babysitting evening. Upon encountering Sarah, mother of Kelly, she realized that poor Kelly was indexed within an inch of her life. Sarah had prepared a thoroughly detailed binder of everything Ashley would ever need to know about Kelly and more. From a tab explicitly spelling out Kelly's allergies to her every phobia, each show she was allowed to watch on TV and when they'd be on, and more. It took a while for Ashley to scoot Sarah out the door, but when she did, Ashley breathed a sigh of relief, wondering if the night was gonna be an easy evening, or what the heck had she gotten herself into? Going through the binder herself, she observed that it was indeed supper time, in accordance with the minute accurate schedule, and began following the precise instructions, prepping the water pot to boil. I would never be able to follow a minute schedule. No, thank you. While she waited for the water to, you know, do its thing, Kelly offered to introduce her to the dolls that were in the living room, and Ashley happily accepted, hoping to figure out if you know, the ward was genuinely neurotic or just a poor victim of extreme helicopter parenting. Kelly introduced Ashley to each doll in great detail, and then began to act out scenarios, pretending as if the dolls were alive and out to hurt her. Now look, I'm not gonna pretend I was a normal kid, but I don't think I put my Barbies in a scenario to like end my life. I'm thinking, yeah, I don't think so. Poor Ashley ran for the binder, flipping through the phobia and usual behavior sections in an attempt to see if there was a way to placate the situation, when suddenly, Kelly stopped, as if nothing had happened. Ashley tried prompting her, seeing what had taken over, but nothing. By this point, the pot in the kitchen had finally reached a boil, and Ashley turned her attention to making dinner, hoping that sticking to the schedule would avoid any further weird behavior. After supper was over, and Kelly was watching one of the pre-approved shows on the list, Ashley noticed that some of the dolls that were previously in the display case had disappeared, and she couldn't find them anywhere in the house. Kelly hadn't left the first floor of the home while Ashley was making dinner, so she couldn't have just run off with them. She tried to shrug it off, but the weird thoughts continued to plague her mind, and rightfully so. It wasn't until later, when the duo was upstairs, that Ashley found one of the dolls hanging upside down from a painting that was way too tall for Kelly to reach in any way, and parts of another throughout Kelly's room while trying to put her to sleep. Ashley was thoroughly terrified at this point, and yeah, ditto, and when Sarah arrived home, bolted from the house as quickly as she could. The next morning, she woke up at home in her own bed with the last of the missing dolls next to her. She mailed it back with no return address and refused to ever enter the Lanford home ever again. Number three, old friends. Our next story is from a Reddit thread asking, what's your ghost story? And I gotta point this one out just cause it was too funny, but the original poster included the title in brackets, serious, to deter any would be paranormal pranksters. Just serious ghost stories, please. Luckily, Redditors obliged. User Barb Katz shared this terrifying tale. 
When I was 37, I went to my high school reunion. I flew into the nearest airport and rented a car. The distance was about 35 miles through a very rural and almost abandoned part of the country. About three miles outside of town, I see someone on the side of the road flagging me down. Up in the north woods, no one ever leaves someone else stranded, and it would turn out that the guy standing there was somebody I'd actually been to school with, my old friend Jim. Jim gets in the car and we start talking, catching up. I hadn't seen him in 20 years, but he still looked the same, maybe just a little bit older. We get to town and I ask him if he wants to come to the reunion with me and have a drink. He says no, just take me back home. Jim's parents had lived only a few blocks from my grandmother's and I turned in that direction, but he said to take him to the part of town that really was just the outskirts, up by the fairground and the cemetery. There was a mobile home park out there and I figured that must be where he lived. When we reached the end of the turn, he said just drop me off here, it was nice to see you again and he walked off into the night. So I went to the high school reunion, met up with some old classmates and we start to talk. Now please understand me here. I am stone cold sober, nor do I ever take anything harder than soda. Tired after a 13 hour flight, but I was completely sober. As we were talking about who was showing up and who wasn't, I mentioned to my old classmate that I just picked Jim up a few miles off east of town and had dropped him up by the fairgrounds. Now for some reason everyone got really, really quiet. Even the guy belting out karaoke stopped, and my cousin went white as a shirt. Barb. Jim died 8 years ago. Rolled his car. I start to feel really dizzy, and I go out to the car to take some deep breaths and decide whether or not I'm going crazy. And there on the seat was a newspaper printed 8 years ago containing Jim's obituary. I still have that damn paper. Every now and again I take it out to stare at it and I still wonder just what the hell happened that night. Number 2. Ghost on the Line The next story comes to us from a thread asking law enforcement officers of reddit what is the creepiest call that you've ever been on. We got a very creepy answer from user Smokey Bonaparte sharing this creepy little tale. The redditor writes, 911 dispatcher calling in. We received a call from an elderly lady who had trouble breathing. I had taken several calls from her before and her husband in the past, so I recognized the voice. I dispatched an ambulance to her residence and held her on the line trying to keep her calm while the ambulance was responding. Ambulances advised that they had a 15 minute ETA as she was in a very rural part of West Virginia. I'm talking to her just about her husband and how she was doing and just making pretty standard small talk with her. The ambulance arrives and I let him know that she is in severe respiratory distress and I still had her on the line. I let her know the ambulance is coming to her door to go answer the door and she says okay and hangs up the phone. Oh that's pretty normal right? Well here's where it gets very weird. The EMT and paramedic on scene call back about a minute after and they say that no one is answering the door. We have a sheriff in the area pulling on scene about that time. The sheriff unit confirmed the address and he's breaching the door to make access to the PT. Five minutes go by and the paramedic on scene radios to ask me who called. I tell them it was the elderly woman who lived on residence. He tells me he's going to call this in and he needs to speak with my shift supervisor. We get him over to the supervisor and the supervisor confirms the same information I relayed that it was all correct and asks what's going on. Apparently the old woman had been dead for a while and was already in full rigor mortis. They thought I was wrong on the caller, but the other dispatchers played it back for them and confirmed it was the old woman who called. The ambulance transferred the hospital and we got the same calls and disbelief from the doctors. But I took a call from a ghost that day. Number 1. Uninvited Guest Closing off our list is this story which chilled my spine like sub-zero. Coming to us from user Parole Model, which hey, by the way, love the pun. It was from an Ask Reddit thread asking, what's the creepiest thing that's ever happened to you? Lots and lots and lots of good ones, but this one took the cake. So lend an ear. I used to visit my friend at her house out in a rural farming area before she moved. I'd sleep over a lot and we'd just hang out and draw. I usually slept in the living room and on the couch, and there were two mirrors in the room that were fairly close to the TV. When the TV was off and I was walking by, I started seeing shadows move behind me. I thought it might just be something off the TV screen, and then one evening I walked into the living room to get my sketchbook so I could sketch in her bedroom. I bent over and picked it up, stood up straight, and I looked in the mirror and saw a man behind me. A man standing in the hallway leading to the living room. He was average height, bald, and a bit old. I turned to look at him and no one was there. I turned to look at the mirror again and he was gone. I felt more than a little spooked. Another time we were just sitting in the living room and we heard what sounded like a kid's footsteps running across upstairs quickly. 
She had two adult siblings, but they were out at work leaving us all alone. Around that time, I decided to sleep in my friend's room instead of the living room, only to wake up in the middle of the night to see four posters slowly get peeled off the wall. No, it wasn't just them falling and dragging each other down. It looked as if someone was carefully unsticking the tape and removing them. The next morning, my friend put them back up saying, well, I need to get some better tape. She and her family eventually moved out because they couldn't afford to keep living there anymore. We would never really talked about anything that had happened in that house, as if talking about it might actually make it worse. But after she moved, I finally confronted her and said it. I said, dude, your house was haunted. I hope you knew that. She replied, yeah, we knew it was. Some guy and his granddaughter used to live there, but he took her life and then took his own. So it was probably them or something. I never told you because I didn't want to scare you. Later, she would dig out a copy of a news article she got from a local paper about the crime. The picture that went with the article was the exact man I saw all those years ago. Oh, 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 okay. I gotta start looking at some of the cute cat picture subreddits or maybe ones with like little monkeys going on adventures after that. Need to clear myself out. Number five. Our first story was shared to Reddit by a user named Girl Porker, and it's a story that'll have you uninstalling Snapchat if you haven't already. One day, Porker received a message from a contact that he didn't recognize. The snaps were innocuous enough, you know, a little, hey, how are you? So he assumed it was a friend messing with him on a new account that he didn't know about. The account told him he should try out a new Snapchat lens called Eyes of the Underworld, which shows you the other world hiding beneath our own. Porker installed the lens and ran it through a bit, describing the lens as a pretty simple effect, saying it just distorts whatever is on screen and adds a few flickering sprites and shadow effects to the background to give off ghostly vibe. Porker assumed it was just, I don't know, marketing stunt for something, advertising something. But Porker said that a few days after, however, he'd noticed that he was sleeping a lot worse than he ever had in his life. Complaining that he was having these violent, turbulent dreams where he was being pursued by shadowy figures that dragged themselves across the floor. This recurring dream happened to him three or four times. He said the dreams were stressing him, but what was really scaring him was how when he woke up, he would notice he had scratches and bruises that he couldn't explain appearing all over him. Porker said he was definitely getting scared and even considered looking into finding an exorcist just in case what he was dealing with was a true supernatural threat, which understandable. I think if I woke up with scratches all over me, I'd assume demons were involved or my cats. Porker smudged his house with sage and attempted to clean his house, but said that this only made things worse. And he started to hear growling late at night and experiencing intense bouts of cold sweats. And in extreme action, Porker destroyed his phone. He filled it to bursting with orange juice to fry the components and hucked it into a river to free himself. Miraculously though, it seemed to work. Porker said that after that the nightmares stopped as quick as they began, and all it cost him was a new phone. I would have tried a factory reset personally before chucking it into the water, but hey, we all have our methods. I don't think a ghost can survive a factory reset. And hey, if you're looking for more ghost stories about creepy technology and all sorts of twisted things out there, Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. If ghosts aren't your jam, we got aliens, we got cryptids, we got conspiracies, we got true crime, we got fake crime. Basically, if it freaks you out, we got a video or two on it. So hit subscribe, please make sure to hit that little bell as well, and I know this is a big ask, would you kindly do that at the end of this video, because I got four more scary Snapchat stories. Keep going. Number four, the Red Rooms. One of the most reoccurring dark web urban legends as well is that of the Red Rooms. What is a Red Room, you ask? Well, it refers to an alleged secret streaming service or website where viewers can pay massive sums of money, usually cryptocurrency, to watch live streams of the darkest things imaginable to the human psyche, uh, being able to make special requests for what they'd like to see. Much like the VIPs from Netflix's Squid Game, if you watched that, and I'm sure most of you did, who all traveled to that mysterious island to pay to watch the games up close and personal, this is allegedly that on a much smaller personal scale, where you wouldn't even have to dress up in an ornate animal mask and fly out to South Korea. Now, it's worth noting that there's some discrepancy as to whether or not these horrifying red rooms really exist exist or if it's an exaggerated story, like a digital campfire legend. The browser used to access deep and dark web content is too slow to run a live stream properly, and alternative browsers struggle as well as they run their traffic through multiple services. That's not to rule it out entirely. The, the web beneath the surface is a wild wasteland, and there have been de deeply disturbing real stories from the dark web of criminals charging uh, for pay-per-view videos of dark acts. So who's to say? I'm not about to crawl through the dark web anytime soon to find out. In third place, we've got a scummy rich man. 
20-year-old Allison worked in a sushi restaurant all during college, and one fateful night noticed an attractive man and his friends during a crazy dinner rush. She described herself as running around like crazy, but managed to give them good service, and in return they tipped well, making them memorable. After the shift, she was at home enjoying an adult beverage and mindlessly swiping on Tinder, trying to recover from all the craziness of the night, when she spotted a profile matching the man from earlier, who was easy to recognize from his distinctive face and tattoos. She took a chance, swiped right, and fell asleep from exhaustion. The next day, she woke up to find out that they had matched, and he'd sent some pretty sweet messages. She decided to engage in conversation, finding out he was in town for business, and he proceeded to ask her out for dinner that night at a fancy restaurant. Thanks to encouragement from her roomies, Allison said yes. The man originally insisted on picking her up, but thankfully, Allison was adamant on canceling the date if he continued. If you ask me, red flag number one for this gal. The two met up at said fancy restaurant, where the man proceeded to order a $200 bottle of wine, lobster, and more with Allison guessing that the total cost of the meal was somewhere in the $600 range. Whoa, I bulk at like a $20 meal, but that's just me. Apparently the conversation started out normal enough, but Allison soon found out that not only was the man married, but allegedly he was in an open relationship. Rightfully, she didn't believe him, so he called his wife on the spot after texting her photos of Allison. Apparently the wife was by and asked her husband to invite Allison to their home in Cancun for some fun together. Red flag number two. Once the call ended, Allison decided to ask the man how he afforded his lifestyle, and he casually mentioned that it was through a drug cartel. Quickly trying to reassure her though that it was all safe and on the up and up. Being a sensible person, Allison immediately tried to leave, but he followed her to her car. He was showing her photos of his wife, saying that she should really go to Cancun with them, and that she owes it to him to go back to his hotel room, since he spent so much on dinner, finally trying to force her to kiss him. Allison was eventually able to get into her car and get away, but was terrified he was going to follow her home. So she drove around for a while, and eventually opted to spend the night at a male friend's home for safety. Oh, and deleted Tinder the moment she got home. In second place, we have your first date gone sour. User Teeny Gecko on Reddit is to thank for sharing this horror tale with the interwebs, and since my tongue is in the mood to trip today, for simplicity's sake, I'll refer to her as Teeny. During a day of mindless swiping, she came across the profile of a guy named Carlos. Thought he was cute, and as one does, swiped right, which resulted in an instant match. They chatted for a while and made plans to meet up at a local carnival at 9 p.m. the next night. Teeny arrived on time but heard nothing from Carlos until he called her at 9.30, claiming to have overslept from a nap, and she told him not to bother showing up saying they'd try again another time. Unfortunately for our romantic pairing, Teenie's dad suddenly took ill, and she spent the next six weeks visiting him daily in the hospital. And between that and work, didn't really have time to date, which made Carlos angry. He made a fake Instagram account, which he used to follow Teenie and everyone that she followed. One night in particular, Teenie's sister had flown into town to visit their dad, and they had gone out to dinner with a group of friends, which had been posted to a friend's public Instagram story. Carlos showed up at the restaurant to confront Teenie, yelling all sorts of profanities, yeah, I don't think I can say those, and thankfully, a waiter who witnessed the entire exchange called the police. For over 10 months since Carlos had Teenie's number, he kept calling her using different phones and she'd pick up the phone to hear only the sound of him breathing. One day in particular, Teenie was expecting a call from a friend and noticed a missed call from a landline she thought belonged to that friend, so she called it back and wound up talking to Carlos's mom. She took the opportunity to tell his mom everything shaking the entire time, worried the mom wouldn't believe her. Now lucky for Teenie, not only did the mom believe her, but begged Teenie not to call the cops, but to call her directly if she ever heard from Carlos ever again. Thankfully, there's a happy ending to this listing, because Carlos never contacted Teenie ever again. In our first place today, we have a stalker. Just a warning for y'all out there watching, this is probably the most my stomach has ever been nauseous while working on a video. In terms of content warning, I will be discussing life ending, so if that's triggering for you, please just skip to the conclusion or feel free to skedaddle. I promise you're not gonna hurt my feelings. Our story begins the same as the rest, with 21-year-old Brit scrolling through Tinder, finding a 27-year-old named Matt that seemed pretty neat. They worked in the same industry, both enjoyed Star Wars and other fandoms, so she swiped right. Of course they matched, or else I wouldn't be talking about the sicky tale today. They talked for hours that first night and realized they had mutual friends, so Brett felt safe enough to meet up with Matt for a public date. The date went well and evolved into a steady relationship. Things were never perfect, with Matt being somewhat transparent about struggling with some mental health issues, but they were undeniably in love. Matt was constantly posting on Instagram about how much Brit was the one, and she was thrilled. After four months of being together, the couple had their first fight, arguing over a reaction Matt had had to Brit joking with a coworker about safety. Brit suggested they take a small break to regroup, feeling unsafe with the level of anger Matt had shown, which led Matt to scream at Brit in the public setting they were in and stonking off. That night, on Instagram, he claimed he was going to end his life, 
posting videos of a nearby mountain cliff saying he was going to jump. Britt and other friends of Matt's were rightfully concerned, and with enough of them calling the police, he was apprehended before he could, but was released from police custody that same night. Britt still cared for Matt, but was rightfully in shock from the events and had taken a pause from texting him to like figure out her mental state. The next day, he showed up to a regularly scheduled brunch date that he and Britt would attend with her friends, but looked at his own table, silently watching the group from a distance until that group of friends decided to just abandon the location and escort Britt safely home. Later that night, Matt took to Instagram claiming he'd been forgotten already, wishing that no one should ever see the day they'd be treated like a freak and many other tangents about being ignored and abandoned. The day after, he posted a long essay to social media, claiming he'd come to his senses and was going to take a break to clear his head also sending a personalized essay to Britt about not wanting to hurt her, but how much he loved her and wanted them to get back together. Britt chose not to respond and debated blocking all his information. His hiatus from social media didn't happen, and Matt posted endless blocks of text for the next two weeks about how people like him don't deserve happy endings, that he would never forgive himself, and listing all the interests he could no longer enjoy because of Britt leaving his life. The last straw for Britt was when he posted artwork of her with her favorite book character, writing a fictionalized accompanying story about her perfect summer vacation without him. She blocked his number and every social media platform she could think of, but Matt was determined to make her take him back. Through a friend, he found out about yet another social event Britt was attending and posted publicly about going just to see her again and actually showed up at this event. This led Britt to involve the police, opting to start the long process for a restraining order. Over the next two months leading up to her first court date, Matt publicly claimed to attempt to end himself no less than a dozen times, with multiple countdowns, flipping between claiming that Britt was cruel and abandoned him, but also that he needed her and the other friends that had since cut ties with him back. He would call her number and leave voicemails, had bookmarked an anonymous app that she had previously used for public questions to send her statements to please take him back, but also asking how much guilt she would feel about celebrating his death and more. I'd be here for over an hour if I went in depth about just how much this guy posted over those months. He would post photos of them together and regularly list off names of people that had cut him off. Finally, the day came for the first court appearance, and despite Matt's claims of wanting to see her, he didn't appear. He later posted that he thought the summons was just a scare tactic, and started yet another death day countdown, this time alleging that he wanted to jump off the roof of Britt's building and haunt her for the rest of her life. Eventually, he was sentenced to prison for his actions, and I've never been happier to see a peaceful ending. Number 5. Walking Dead my first true tale of phantasmic terror comes to us from Reddit user Jalka. Answering a question posed in the thread, nurses and doctors of Reddit, what's the weirdest and most paranormal thing you've ever experienced? Hospitals already seem pretty haunted as is, so it's no surprise that there was so many good answers. But Jalka stood out. Take a listen. I'm a psychiatric nurse, and early on in my career, I worked at a residential mental health facility. One of our residents was an elective mute, which means that he didn't talk, but there was no medical reasoning as to why. He had spoken earlier in his life, and in fact seemed quite normal back then, with the exception of being close to 7 feet tall. He'd been raised in the deep south and joined the army when he was 19, but one night he vanished. He was declared AWOL, and eventually he was declared missing, and later officially declared dead. However, 10 years later, a 7 foot tall man walked into a Virginia hospital ER in my part of the Midwest and said to the receptionist, My name is Marion Deshed and I've been dead for 10 years. And according to the Redditor, those were the last words he ever spoke to anyone. He had shown up to the hospital covered in dust and wearing an old uniform that he'd been wearing the night he vanished. His social security had not been used at all and he had no ID on him whatsoever. However, via fingerprints, they were able to identify him. The family was notified, but they said they had already grieved their lost man and that whoever was claiming to be him simply wasn't, and asked to never be contacted again. The nurse went on to add that Marion would pace all day, every day, moving his mouth in a way that looked like he was muttering to himself, but nothing came out when he moved his lips. He had an unnerving habit of throwing his head back with his mouth wide open as if he was laughing hysterically but not so much as a breath could ever be heard. The nurse said she tried talking to him almost daily, and he would appear to listen, but only react by periodically throwing his head back in that laughter mimicking way of his. Various medications and treatment plans were pursued, but nothing ever affected him. Therapy was tried as well, but all that would happen was Marion would just grin and start pacing again. She goes on to say that on her last day, she saw Marion pacing in the parking lot, throwing back his head to laugh. She closes by saying all those years she'd wondered, was he a ghost? And all those years later, she still doesn't know. 
Click through and listen to as many top five scary videos as your ears can handle. Moving on. Number four, the things that go bunk in the night. Now you would never, ever, ever believe this, but our next story comes from Reddit as well. A similar thread, a similar question. What's the most paranormal thing you've ever experienced? Lots of good ones to pick from, but this one from Mad Rampager really stood out for me. I used to be in the military. The training camp bunk that we lived in was said to be haunted. Occasionally, our stuff would go missing and reappear in weird places, like under our bed or inside a bag that we'd zipped up and stuff. No big deal, right? Weird things happen, and I mean human error and all that. Well then came the instance that freaked everybody out. It was night, after lights out, and my friend was on his phone texting his girlfriend. Most of us had been drifting off to sleep and we were lying on our beds when suddenly my friend heard the shuffling of feet from the corridor. So, thinking that it was our sergeant, he quickly hid his phone under his pillow, rolled over on his side, and tried to get to sleep. What happened next still chills me to the bone to this day. While he pretended to sleep, he heard someone right behind him at the other end of the bed saying, don't worry, you can continue to pretend to sleep. I could have dismissed this as a figment of his imagination, except me and five other people around him heard it. Creepier still, there was no one there. And weirdly, it sounded like the voice of a young girl that had said it. For reference, our camp was in the middle of an island and was set up away from the main admin building. The island had been closed by the government for army training purposes for the past 15 years, so there were definitely no civilians around, let alone any children. To make matters freakier, when we came back from our weekend home leave, there was a bunch of hair on his bed, neatly bundled up, long and jet black, and underneath his pillow was a note. Remember me? Now as I said, we're in the middle of a forest, in the middle of an island, and at that point in time, there were no female recruits whatsoever on the island. Our bunks were locked for the weekend, and the duty sergeant had no idea what had happened. We never spoke about it again after that night, and it still chills me every time I think about it. Number three on this list is The Voice. This is a story of a forest ranger who was on a personal trip, and it's just all kinds of creepy. Ranker says, I was on a big camping trip with my friends at Suwannee River Music Park in Florida. My sister and I decided to go off and explore some trails around 11 p.m. There was a trail connected to the one we were on, but there was yellow tape strung up between the two trees at the entrance. We decided to go in anyway. About 15 steps into the trail, we both hear clear as day, unmistakably, our mother's voice voice say, honey, why is your nose bleeding? Our mother was not on this trip with us. We turn around to see nothing, being kind of spooked, we both started to head back to the main trail. A few minutes later, my sister had a nosebleed that lasted like 20 seconds. Now this one is just plain weird, guys. Who was that voice? Where was it coming from? Why did it sound like their mother, and how on earth did it know what was going to happen? So many questions and so little answers with a story like this. Maybe there was something special about this trail and that's why it was taped off. Did someone die here and the ghost was the one imitating their mother's voice? That still doesn't explain how that ghost would know how their mother sounds and also what's going to happen in the future. It seems like they stumbled upon an area of the forest where conventional laws of the world don't apply. Number two on this list is the invisible man. I guess invisible might not be the best word to describe this guy because you could see him. He just wasn't actually there. Ranker says, I worked at a summer camp where the cabins were arranged in a circle with a center building that was used for showers and bathrooms. One night, one of my campers, about 12 years old, asks to go to the bathroom just as we had all gone to bed. I tell him to take his bunkmate and go quickly. The bathroom building is about 100 feet away. The kids are kind of dorking around like kids do and they take off the bathroom running. All of a sudden, I hear screams that still haunt me. Hysterical, choking for air, horror movies. Movie screams. I jump up and run out and I see the two boys sitting on the ground right outside the bathrooms and they're kind of holding each other. After a few minutes they calm down enough and say that they ran through a man. They say he appeared right before they got to the bathroom door and was standing in the doorway. They didn't have enough space to stop and they put their hands up to go through him and into the door. They said there was cold air around him and that was it. He was gone. They said he had a suit on and black slick back hair and was smiling. Literally two Two kids ran through a dude. This is the type of core memory that I do not want to have. The kids left the camp the next day and apparently were never the same after that. Clearly this man must have been a ghost that died here, but from what and who he was, we may never know. 
And finally, number one on this list is a jungle spirit. Yeah, you heard that right, guys. A literal spirit from the jungle. The story goes, I was working at a survey station deep in the Malaysian jungle in Borneo. I was sleeping in one of the dorms with some of the rangers we were working with, five people in the total dorm. That night, I was having a nightmare and woke up at about 2 a.m. to the sound of footsteps outside. Whatever it was was fairly big and sounded bipedal. It stopped right outside the window, so I'm staring back at the window trying hard to see. Suddenly, one of the rangers shifted in her bed making a noise and I could hear whatever it was running away quite fast. Being a rather skeptical person in general, I woke up and asked the rangers the next day about it. They adamantly believed that it was a jungle spirit coming to check us out. The station stood on stilts so the window sits about 10 feet off the ground. I asked about the possibility of it being a wild animal but they said that the only things big enough to make that loud of a footprint would have been sun bear or a cloud leopard. They said it's generally unheard of for those animals to make it that close to the survey station since there are usually people milling about. The rangers have heard the footsteps before and they firmly believe that a jungle spirit was roaming about the site. I'm getting serious predator vibes from this story guys. Honestly, if I had this experience, then I am out of there. I don't need to be stalked and eaten by some ancient Malaysian jungle spirit. No thank you. Knowing that you can get attacked by real life animals is bad enough, let alone Coming in number three, we've got pus brain. Not two words you really want to see together, right? Well, just listen to this story from user Slappy McSlappenstein. It speaks for itself. When I worked in healthcare, I had a patient who got a sinus infection. He stopped taking his antibiotics after a few days because he felt better. His sinus infection came back with a vengeance. When he got to the emergency department, he was presenting with stroke symptoms. The infection had spread to his cranial cavity. There was so much pus that it was twisting his brain. No one thought he would survive the surgery. Surgery. The family was advised to expect the worst, but amazingly he actually survived. He ended up needing three more surgeries to wash out and spent almost two months in the hospital. So take your full dose of antibiotics, people. How are we feeling about this one? A little, little headache? Checking in on your sinus health? Because that is absolutely bonkers. This dude essentially had to have a brain enema because of the filth built up in his dome. That stuff comes back with a vengeance, like he said, if you're not careful. So listen to your local healthcare worker and finish your antibiotics regimen. Coming in at number two, we've got the suffocation station. In a lot of creepypasta stories, folks who are left near some dangerous chemical or enclosed space often go mad. You know, self mutilation, murder, hideous mutations, the works. In this story, though, the folks put in an unsafe situation don't end up doing a whole lot of that. They just die, and they die quick. We live in a cruel world, and if the folks running companies aren't careful or tend to cut corners, a lot of bad stuff can happen. Take it from Reddit user Animator Spaminator. I heard this from my grandpa. He used to work in the oil slash gas industry. His father actually owned the company. Anyways, they had these huge tanks full of some deadly gas that's heavier than oxygen. Some guy went down to measure the size of the tank, suffocated, and died. Another guy found him at the bottom, wanted to help him, and he went down after him, suffocated, died after falling off the ladder down. Third guy does the same. Eventually, my grandpa finds three dead bodies at the bottom of a large tank, all having suffocated on this toxic gas. They have vents in these tanks now, which is good. Yeah, the poor grandpa. Imagine strolling into work and discovering not one, not two, but three dead bodies. All because of an invisible assailant that robbed the oxygen from their lungs. And finally, at number one, we've got the Outback Backpack Killer. If I was ever to visit Australia, I would be on the lookout for killer animals, bugs, and temperatures. In fact, killer people probably wouldn't even cross my mind. However, as this story shows us, murderous lunatics can be anywhere at any time. User Passometer has this story to tell. I met a guy who had been traveling Australia with a couple friends, hitchhiking around as many of us have done. One of his friends told him that they were near his distant uncle's house, whom he never never met before. He got a phone number from a family member and as they had hoped, the uncle offered them a place to stay. He picked them up in town and drove them out to his rural property way out in the bush. They said he seemed like a pretty normal guy, friendly and cheery. When it was time to set up a place to sleep, the uncle took them to a closet that was totally full of sleeping bags and bed rolls. They didn't think much of it at the time and all grabbed a kit and set up on the living room floor. They stayed a couple days and nothing out of the ordinary happened, but afterwards the uncle drove them to the bus station and they continued on their way. About a year later, the man was arrested and charged with several counts of murder. He was the man who was picking up young hitchhiking backpackers and slaughtering them. The guy who told me this story was 100% certain he had slept in the sleeping bag of one of his victims. And now this guy has to walk around for the rest of his life with the knowledge that he slept in a death sleeping bag. 
definitely the kind of story that ends up as the central focus of a true crime podcast. Kicking off this list in fifth place, we've got attempted insemination. For safety's sake, since I have a lovely lexicon of no no words to avoid, Ask someone in the comments if y'all are confused about my wording at any point. 19 year old Tanner met 22 year old Miranda through Tinder while well, they attended the same college. And the first time they hung out, it was a casual Netflix hangout at Miranda's place, and he left thinking she was decent. It wasn't against making future plans. They started texting and Snapchatting throughout the following week and organized some plans for the upcoming weekend. Out of nowhere, she started sending him unsolicited. Fun picks. He has very adamantly stated that he never once asked for them, and while they were hanging out the weekend prior, there was no fun activity at any level. While it caught him off guard, he wasn't put off by the advances. Fast forward to the weekend, Miranda and Tanner are hanging out at his place with his roommates when she asks if she can stay the night, and Tanner agrees to it. Being a gentleman, he offered to take the couch, but she mentioned she'd rather share his bed. Something he's up into. As things move to the bedroom, they engage in consensual intercourse, with Tanner shedding his condom after the events end. After lying together for a few minutes, Miranda gets up abruptly, grabs the condom off the floor, and runs into the bathroom. Tanner was a little confused, maybe a little concerned, but didn't read too much into it until he heard a loud crash in the bathroom, Miranda cursing, followed by no response to his query if she needed help. Out of concern, thinking she fell and you know cracked her head open or something, he approached the washroom, witnessing Miranda standing in his shower with one leg propped up, trying to shove the condom up her um, hoo-ha after she had flipped it inside out. Tanner rightfully panicked and slammed the door, unsure of how to act. Miranda quickly left, and Tanner never heard from her ever again. While this story might not seem as horrific as others to come, it definitely left my mind boggled. In fourth place, we have a multifaceted date. On a random lonely fall day, resident lonely heart Nicholas was swiping and matched up with a lovely looking lady named Holly and sent off a hello to kickstart a conversation. While I might not be much of a dating app expert, that's quite often a long shot way of catching attention, but hey, it worked. Holly immediately offered to meet up, and Nicholas jumped at the offer, with the duo deciding to meet at a nearby frozen yogurt spot. When he arrived, Holly was already deep in a bowl of dessert, so he purchased his own serving and joined her, with the duo exchanging the usual small talk to break the ice. Eventually, the topic of school came up, and at the time, Nicholas was a junior in college. So he told Holly about what he was studying, and that he wasn't entirely sure what he wanted to do after he graduated. She laughed in response, saying she knew exactly what he meant. Who doesn't? Holly explained that throughout her time in high school, she regularly wore men's clothing, and as a result, had an interest in designing men's clothes. So naturally, Nicholas asked if she was studying fashion, and she responded by telling him that she hated high school so much that she decided not to go to college. Which, you know, honestly, I can kind of understand. She continued by saying that she was a very creative person, and that she was writing a book before also casually mentioning how she was in the process of starting a photography company. Nicholas asked how those were going, and she said that they were more theoretical than reality at that point, going on to explain that her backup plan, if none of the other endeavors panned out, was to become a surgeon. Although she lacked any of the training for it, Holly gleefully told Nicholas that she could see herself going down that path because she wasn't afraid of red bodily fluids and gore, which uh, grossed Nicholas out. Without prompting, Holly continued by telling him that she was certain she could handle the graphic nature of being a surgeon because she personally euthanized a sheep that past summer. Describing the ending in detail, going as far as mimicking the um, human-like shriek that the animal made when she uh, ended it. Now this is where most people would probably start, you know, making a run for it, but Nicholas was determined to see if there was more to this wild tale. All right, Holly went more in depth with details, claiming that her family regularly euthanized goats and sheep as part of rituals for their strong shaman background. She hushed her voice as she leaned in and said that her religion had actually gifted her with psychic powers, which manifested as voices in her head, and those voices were so strong that they were telling her exactly what to write in that book that she had already mentioned. At this point, Nicholas finally made an excuse to leave, blocking her, and never heard from her ever again. Number three. I was home alone and my parents were out of town. We just moved into the house, so there was an empty lot next to the house with a half built house on it. My parents were the types to always leave the door unlocked. While they were gone, I was watching TV when all of a sudden, the door that leads into my garage from the inside starts to wiggle. I put my TV on mute to listen and I see it move this time. I start freaking out and I'm kind of in shock looking for the phone. I can't find the house phone, so I search for myself. I remembered I left my charger in my parents car, so now I am frantically looking for the house phone. Our house was pretty new, so my mom hadn't even put blinds or drapes up in the kitchen or living room. Again, no blinds, no phone. Whoever was wiggling the doorknob starts 
banging on the windows in the living room. I shoot upstairs looking frantically for the phone and also trying to figure out how and where I'd jump out of my house to get away from the maniac that's probably outside my door if I needed to. He then starts pounding on my door. I can tell at this point that he's using something metal or plastic by the sound of the thumps. I genuinely thought he was going to shoot my door open. I remember it that because I was mad at myself for being such a fool. I frequently talked on the phone and I always just left it lying around. I never put it back on the base. I wanted so badly to push the button to detect where my house phone is, but I thought if he heard where it was, he'd break the window near it and take it. I then remembered. I left the phone in my mom's room. And as I pass the hallway, I see her dad's old weapon in my parents' bedroom, a long arm. I find the phone and I call 911. As I'm on the phone, the window breaks. I'm upstairs and I am scared to death and suddenly everything goes silent. I'm waiting in my parents bedroom. Pitch black closet for what seems like eternity. I hear the sirens. Cops show up but there's no one to be found. I figured they hadn't gone too far since the incident had just occurred, but the cops never found my tormentor. On the plus side, the company that built the house next to us hired overnight security for the house, which was definitely refreshing. Number 2 In fall 2016, I moved into half of a really old house. It was built in the 1880s, a stone's throw from the original campus of Indiana State, which is now a park filled with homeless people. The owners basically turned it into a weird duplex kind of deal. Anyway, the layout of this house was pretty weird. You walked in the door and you were in a living room type space and then you kept walking and there was a doorway to a bedroom and past that was the kitchen. No doors. Only door inside the apartment was to the bathroom and one that led to the shared basement. This is a terrible living situation, may I say. My first night there was uneventful. I was kind of uncomfortable because I hadn't lived by myself in a long time and I was just sort of feeling lonely and on edge. I stayed up late and eventually fell asleep but woke up around 3 in the morning. Cliche, I know. What woke me up? sounded like a group of drummers were drumming on every flat surface of the living room. It went on for a while and I was completely terrified. It was just a cacophony of sound. After about two or three minutes, I finally gathered up the courage to get up and check on it. And as I soon as I passed the threshold to the living room, it just stopped. Nothing happened the rest of the night, but I didn't get much sleep at all. A couple of days later, my friend was visiting and he was about to leave. We were standing by the front door to my bookshelf and I told him about how I was having trouble sleeping. And I told him that story about my first night there. As I was saying this, a book threw itself off the bookshelf and onto the floor three feet away. It had to fly past the dresser the shelf was perched and landed between the two of us. He just gave me a creeped out look and said, I have to go and I don't blame him. Eventually, I asked the guy in the other half of the apartment what was up, as he'd lived there for eight years. He told me that no one stayed longer than a year, and they all reported the same stuff. For whatever reason, he said nothing ever happened on his side. Doesn't make sense, but there it is. And sometimes, you just don't get the answers, and that's way scarier. And number one, do you remember your first job? Mine was a newspaper route. Maybe yours was like a grocery store clerk or a babysitter. This next tale is a tale of babysitting gone deeply wrong. Perhaps one of the most infamous home invasion stories in American history is the babysitter killings in 1978. Lauren Strode was a young woman looking to take on a bit of responsibility and earn some spare pocket cash for the upcoming summer. She and her friends had a bit of a sitter's club. On October 31st, 1978, Strode was looking after Tommy Doyle, a neighborhood boy while his parents were out, alongside friends Ann Brackett and Linda Vanderklok looking after one Lindsay Wallace. It seemed like it would be a fun night like any other in a sleepy town. Unfortunately, unbeknownst to the girls, earlier that week a mental patient from Smith's Grove Sanitarium nearby had escaped containment and was on the loose and suspected to be around the Haddonfield area. A quiet investigation being led by Sheriff Brackett, Ann's father, and a psychiatrist at Smith's Grove was underway to try and apprehend the patient, who had been incarcerated after killing his sister years ago in a fit of unprecedented terrifying violence. The patient had disguised himself and was stalking the streets of Haddonfield and had come across Strode out of a psychotic obsession. He stalked the girl for days until eventually making his move, and then proceeded proceeded to invade the home of Linda Vanderklok and strangled her alongside boyfriend Bobby Sims. Strode protected the youth she was looking after, and thankfully both Tommy Doyle and Lindsay Wallace were not harmed in any way, and boldly attacked the invader with a knitting needle, subduing him long enough for authorities to arrive, where he was apprehended and returned to Smith's 
Grove Sanitarium, where he remained for 40 years. Strode remained in Haddonfield, where she lives quietly and would prefer not to be disturbed, looking after her daughter and granddaughter, and does not celebrate Halloween much anymore. 